Yay or Nay Show with Alex P. A sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. And now, here is Alex P. All right, here we go. It is the Yay or Nay Show with Alex C, a sports show for sports fans by a sports fan. A lot of stuff to talk about today. Um, really quickly, before we get into the obvious, the preview of tonight's Thursday night football game, uh, there's a lot of other stuff to talk about. Believe me, make no mistake about it. NBA now going on. Uh, we got, you know, Major League Baseball playoffs, which is where I want to start today. And then we're going to talk a little NBA. Then we'll get into the uh, Thursday night preview. But, you know, it's amazing to me. Baseball has been great. I knew going into the playoffs, this was going to be one of the best playoffs in a long time for a variety of reasons. Number one, we're all looking forward to sports. We couldn't really enjoy it last year. No fans in the stands. I've said it about every sport there is. Football, basketball, baseball, doesn't matter. No fans in the stands made it very difficult to watch. It was kind of cringy. It was hard to be focused and watch, especially when baseball put cardboard people in the stands. That looked like you were watching an episode of South Park. It was just bad. It was very bad. It was hard to watch. Let's be real. It is what it is. This year, fans in the stands, all the enthusiasm is back. All the excitement is back. And it's been great. So arguably, you know, the Dodgers, one of the top three teams coming in the playoffs because you had the Red Sox that were red hot. You had the St. Louis Cardinals that were red hot. And then you had the Dodgers, which, if I'm understanding correctly, had to win 15 in a row to make it into the playoffs. So they played great ball. And then, of course, they had, you know, the one game where they had to go against San Francisco, which there's a big controversy in regards to the call of the strike. And you got a lot of people defending that. And that's probably a different discussion for another day. And I'm sure I'll have that another day. But I don't want to get in depth in that today because then I'll get lost and go down that rabbit hole. And the next thing you know, we won't have the discussion I'm trying to have. But Dodgers, easily one of the top three teams in regards to being the hottest going into the last 30 days of the season. Uh, they came in. They have played really tight. I've been watching all these games, and it's been hard. I've been toggling between all these baseball games, watching football, now watching basketball. But basketball just got in. But toggling between baseball and football, and it's been hard to watch all these games. But I've been watching as many as I can. But one of the things that I've noticed about the Dodgers, they've been playing tight. Uh, they don't seem to be blowing up and, you know, scoring a lot of runs and they're just really tight and they're relying a lot on pitching and the pitching, you know, has been there for the most part uh, until this series, though, they seem to be having a huge problem with pitching or maybe it's that Atlanta got hot with the bats because they're blowing up and scoring a lot of runs. It's hard to know for sure which one you want to blame it on, but I would go more towards the pitching not being there. And really, it's a battle of attrition at this point because, you know, all these pitchers, I mean, what are they pitching like on average uh, three times in the last 11 days? I mean, they're going at it. If you're still in this series, you know, you've thrown a lot of balls on a lot shorter rest than what you're used to during the regular season. Now, granted, I understand the argument. This is why you get paid the millions of dollars to be a pitcher in Major League Baseball. And I understand that. But that still doesn't take away from the fact that you are struggling because of the fact that you're going on shorter rest. The pressure is a lot higher and the bats are swinging for the fences like crazy because everybody wants to be the hero and everyone wants to put one out of the park because they want to hurry up and try and put their opponent away as quick as possible, which makes perfect sense. And again, when I look at the Dodgers, when I look at all the games they've played, they've been tight. I haven't seen them blow up or explode. You know, they've had a lot of, you know, ninth inning wins and losses. You know, it's just the reality of what we've been looking at. A lot of ninth inning wins and losses for the Dodgers. Atlanta's kind of, you know, hit and miss. They're kind of hot and cold, uh, consistent on defense, uh, pretty consistent on pitching. Um, and obviously, you know, they wouldn't be in a position where they're up three games to one if they weren't being a little more consistent pitching wise than the Dodgers. But if I had to break it down, is it the pitching or is it the hitting for Atlanta? I'd honestly say it's a combination of both. It's the offense, really, that's letting the pitchers pitch a lot looser than what the Dodgers are dealing with. Because in my opinion, and again, this is my opinion. I'm not an insider. I'm a sports fan doing a sports show for sports fans. I got to continue to always say that. But the thing is, is that I think the Dodgers have the better pitching staff. But they're getting outpitched because the best offense is the one that's dictating what's going to happen on defense, meaning because of Atlanta's offense, they're making it easier on the defense for the Braves because the pitching is able to be more loose. 
uh, more relaxed. Dodgers feeling the pressure, especially now going into today's game, which again, I'm waiting to see. I'm going to watch that and then I'm going to toggle into the Thursday night game as I can go back and forth between the two. But I think tonight's game, I know that Vegas has the Dodgers basically winning tonight's game. I don't know that I agree with that in all honesty. I think Atlanta, even though they're in L.A., I think they put the Dodgers away. I think the fans are going to have their hands on top of their heads at the end of this game. I think the Dodgers are going to be sitting in their home dugout, bummed out, staring and watching the celebration that the Braves are putting on as they get ready to move on to the World Series. I honestly think that's what's going to happen. Again, because... The Braves bats have come alive and they are doing it. They're getting it done. And again, it's allowing their pitching staff to be relaxed. You can easily tell when you look on the pitching mound that the Braves are more relaxed than the Dodgers. And again, it's because the bats for the Dodgers have never really come into play. Throughout this entire playoffs, the bats for the Dodgers have never really come out to play. And that has been the downfall. So the pitchers have pitched tight because they're feeling the pressure of the fact that their offense isn't scoring, which means it's on the shoulders of the pitcher to keep the Braves from scoring. And when they don't, or when they got base hits and they got consecutive hits, or the Braves hit a home run, it just makes the pitcher that much more tight, which explains why you have all these pitching changes for the Dodgers. So I think you're going to see a lot more pitching changes for the Dodgers tonight. I know that I believe, if I understood correctly, tonight is a bullpen game for the Dodgers. Last night was a bullpen game for the Braves, which, by the way, the Dodgers realistically should have been able to take advantage of that fact. The fact that it was a bullpen day for the Braves means that realistically the offense for the Dodgers, if at nothing else, should have been able to explode at least for that one game and it didn't happen. It's because they're playing tight. I think the pressure's there. I think the fact that they are the reigning defending champions is there. I think the fact that, you know, they're looking at trying to be repeat champions. And let's face it, there really is no such thing as repeat champions in any sport. Football, basketball, baseball, doesn't matter. Being a repeat champion is one of the most difficult things in professional sports to do. Dodgers obviously aren't going to get it done this year. And I think they're out after tonight. Um, Red Sox, we'll talk about them tomorrow. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about them today, but I don't want to run out of time in regards to everything that I got going on. I've went over time on a few of the past shows that I've recently done. So again, I know Vegas has Dodgers picked as being the winner for tonight. I think it's over. I think the Braves are celebrating and I think the Braves are on their way to the World Series. I honestly think that's what's going to happen. Um, now. Thursday night football, a lot of things. I started to talk about this a little bit yesterday with my guest, Dale. I started to talk about this a little bit the day before also. <clears throat> Reason why is it involves the Cleveland Browns. All right, now, a lot of things are going on in Cleveland, okay? Um, I know I have said the unpopular thing that it's time for Cleveland fans to go back to being Cleveland fans uh, with their – you know, bags over their heads in the stands. It's time to do it again. Uh, Cleveland is who they've always been. They're, you know, going to be one of those teams that's going to be on the outside looking in. They're not going to make the playoffs. I know you still have the national media trying to tell you that, oh, yes, they are. They're going to make the playoffs. Everything's going to be great. Uh, don't worry. They're still going to win their division. Look, even if, and it's a heck of an if, because I definitely would argue with people who say that without, the starting quarterback, Baker Mayfield, for Cleveland, they're going to be okay because of the strength of schedule, because of the division. And I'm like, no. No, they're not. No. They're not going to be okay because of the strength of the schedule and because of their division. That doesn't even make sense to me when you really think about it. Because how can you tell me that Cleveland's going to be okay when they're going against Cincinnati, Baltimore and Pittsburgh. And there was a national guy today today trying to say that, oh, don't worry, they're going to be fine, everything's good. Look, just Baltimore alone is enough to say Cleveland is done. Why? Because Baltimore is going to win the division. And then there seems to be a little bit of resurgence with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I don't think Pittsburgh is going to be a threat to anybody, but they're definitely playing better ball than Cleveland is. And let's not forget the team that's playing better than Pittsburgh and Cleveland combined, and that's the Cincinnati Bengals with Joe Burrow. 
And the point is, because there's a lot of tendrils off this game tonight and off this team in the Cleveland Browns, Baker Mayfield's playing for a contract. A lot of people are talking about, do you think ownership's made up their mind yet? And you got other people that are saying, well, this is what he's worth now. They are going to give him an extension. They're going to give him $150 million. They're definitely not going to give him the 250 or whatever he thinks he's going to be able to get because he's not playing up to par for that. Right now, he's worth about 150 And if he wins the AFC Championship and goes to the Super Bowl, then he'll be worth the 250 and it'll be a different discussion. First of all, again, these are guys that do this for a living. What makes you think Cleveland has a shot at going to the AFC Championship? What makes you think Cleveland has a shot at going to the Super Bowl? What makes you think Cleveland has a shot to make a deep run in the playoffs to begin with? Have you not watched any Cleveland Brown games? Do you professional guys really not watch the sports that you talk about on a daily basis and get paid to analyze on a daily basis? Because you guys fumble a lot when you talk about these teams. Because there's no way in the world anybody could tell me the Cleveland Browns are a playoff team. The Cleveland Browns have any chance in any way, shape, or form to win this division because they have zero prayer. So for everybody that says, oh, yes, they do, and yes, they can, and they're going to be okay, and with Case Keenan, they're going to be fine, and all they got to do is win a couple of games, wait for Baker to come back, and they're going to be perfectly fine. Uh, No, they're not. I'll make the prediction now. Cleveland's not going to make the playoffs, and Cleveland's not going to win the division. Where, again, these guys that get paid to do this for a living – Come off saying that Cleveland has a chance to win the division, make the playoffs, and potentially go to the Super Bowl is hilarious to me. These guys, I'm telling you, I don't know how some of these guys get their jobs with some of the crappy analyzing they do because it's like they don't know sports at all. I listen to some of these guys talk, and I'm talking about on the four-letter network. I listen to some of these guys talk, and I'm like, your daddy must have worked for the network, and that's how you got the job because you know absolutely zero about sports. Because anybody, and I don't care if you're a former player saying this, and I have heard some former players say this, I don't care if you're a former player. If you say that the Cleveland Browns have a shot at winning the division, going to the Super Bowl, and they're perfectly fine where they are right now, they don't need to hit the panic button, then you don't know anything about football. Or at least, if nothing else, you lost a lot of credibility talking about football, saying that Cleveland Browns got a shot at the division, got a shot at making the playoffs and got a shot at making a run deep into the playoffs going to the Super Bowl. That is the biggest joke and the worst analysis of a team that you could possibly make. That is absolutely absurd to make that statement. Again, I don't know how some of these people got their jobs. I guess their daddy works for the network or something because it makes no sense at all how these guys can be talking about football, and yet they know nothing about football absolutely amazing to me. I hear this on a daily basis. It's They should be embarrassed. And the thing is, nobody ever calls them out on it. I call them out on it because, again, I'm telling you differently, and I'm telling you from the eye test. I'm telling you from what I think and what I watch and what I actually see. Again, I'm not convinced these guys watch sports. I think they listen to what other people say and they repeat it, or maybe they watch highlights on YouTube and then they just turn around and go off of what they see on YouTube highlights. But I don't think they actually watch sports because if they did, they would see, even with a healthy Baker Mayfield, this Cleveland Browns team has been on the decline since the season started. For all of the preseason hype, For all of the stuff that everybody has said about Cleveland, about how they're going to be a threat, how it's going to be them and Buffalo, and then they are going to be the ones that everybody else in the AFC is going to have to worry about. They didn't even bring up Baltimore. Wasn't I the one who brought up Baltimore all offseason long? Wasn't I the one that said that Baltimore was the one who quietly made all the right moves? And look at, even with all the injuries that the Ravens have taken, they are still destroying everybody. They still cannot be stopped. They are still offensively putting a lot of points on the boards. And they are still, in my estimation, going to be the ones to win the AFC North, not the Cleveland Browns. Absolutely absurd for these national guys to say that the Cleveland Browns got a shot at winning the AFC North. It is clearly, it is easily, and it's safe to say, because again, Baltimore is probably one of those most banged up and injured teams in the NFL, and yet they are still winning games as if they are at full strength. Why? Because of Lamar Jackson and the excellent coaching that the Baltimore Ravens are enjoying. 
So it is easy and it is safe to say the Baltimore Ravens are going to win the AFC North. There is no doubt about that in my mind in any way, shape, or form. And again, to watch these guys on the four-letter network and listen to them make the huge mistake of saying the Cleveland Browns don't need – they need to not only hit the panic, but they need to hit the fire alarm. They don't need to fire the coach. They don't need to clean house, okay? What they need to do first and foremost, before they worry about anybody else on that roster, is they need to figure out who's going to be the starting quarterback because it can't be Baker Mayfield moving forward after this season. If you want to leave him in for the remainder of the season, it's perfectly fine because, again, he's the best you have now. If you're talking about Baker Mayfield or Case Keenum, it's obviously going to be Baker Mayfield. But the thing about it is keep in mind, even with Baker Mayfield in the lineup, you never had a shot. Never. And never, 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 never is easy to say. You never had a shot of winning the AFC North. You do not have a shot at winning the AFC North. And it is easily and clearly the Baltimore Ravens are the best team in the AFC North. Uh, Cincinnati is, mm, they're the second best, but it's not even close, really. I mean, Joe Burrow's coming into his own. Obviously, he's doing his thing. But keep in mind, Joe Burrow, they've got a lot of issues they got to fix, right? they got an offensive line that can't block. Um, they've got a lot of question marks in regards to, you know, what their offensive structure is. Joe Burrow doing a great job, but they seem to be slow. Uh, they seem to be having to do a lot of changes to their game plan throughout every game that they play. They seem to be slow to the start. Everybody else seems quick to the start, and Cincinnati's playing catch-up, or maybe they're just in a stalemate, and then in the end they're having to figure out how to pull away. But those types of things stop working in your favor after a while. After a while, those types of victories don't come. So the fact that they're getting them now is great, and I'll attribute a lot of that to Joe Burrow, obviously. Um, and I don't have a problem with the coaching. I'm not saying the coaching is bad. I'm saying they have questions that they need to analyze and figure out. And I think they got problems on special teams. I definitely, without a doubt, think they got a problem on the offensive line. And they got problems on defense because I don't think their defensive line – has the ability to put pressure on anybody either. I think uh, too many times their opponents have too much time to sit back, relax, find a wide open receiver. And again, the secondary strong. They're a lot stronger than most secondaries in the NFL. And I like their secondary. Um, but I'm not impressed with the offensive defensive lines. And I think the offensive line is a big problem. I mean, just to look at Joe Burrow and how many times you're picking him up off the ground. They can't block anybody. And if you blitz Cincinnati... It's your best, best defense. And Joe Burrow, because he's a rookie, the game's still too fast for him. And again, they're finding ways to win. They're making it happen. But it just seems like it's always taking the one big play for Cincinnati to be able to get the win. And sometimes you're just not going to be able to depend on that one big play. Sometimes it's going to be the other team getting that one big play. And that will be the Achilles heel in the downfall for the Cincinnati Bengals. So. Tonight's game, again, Case Keenum being the starting quarterback for Cleveland. Uh, I'll give the advantage to Cleveland. I think that they are going to win because I have always said, and I believe everybody agrees with me now, once again, the national media joins the party. I'm first. They're second. Denver was no good. They beat unwinnable teams. I mean, teams that, you know, haven't done anything and aren't going to do anything at all this season. And as soon as they started to play any kind of quality, you know, Denver's lost every game. And this will be another where they're not necessarily paying quality because, again, I don't call Cleveland quality, but Cleveland is a better caliber than the teams that Denver was victorious over. And I I really don't even know if I believe in Denver's coaching. I think that uh, for all the people, again, national media guys, once again, kept saying, keep saying for years and years and years, at least the last five years, I've been listening to the national media guys try and tell you how on paper the Denver Broncos have the best offense, the best defense, and they don't understand why they're not there making a run for the Super Bowl. But if, if Denver could figure out the one thing they need to figure out, the one thing that everybody believed that was stopping Denver from making a run for the Super Bowl, which was get a quarterback, that they would be fine. Now, Denver still hasn't got a quarterback, obviously. Uh, I would think 
most people would agree that they knew going into the season that they put a Band-Aid on a problem, but they didn't have the solution to the problem. So I think, you know, everybody realizes that, you know, they got a little excited for the 3-0 and start, but, you know, reality hit them quick. But again, I don't think anybody started screaming they found the solution to quarterbacking, even when Denver was 3-0 and at the beginning of the season. So I'll give everybody credit for that. But the thing is, is for everybody who continues to say how Denver has the best defense and a consecutively over the past few years had the best defense and they've got the best offense. And the only thing they were ever missing was a quarterback. And if they could find a quarterback, then Denver would be someone to contend for the AFC and go to the Super Bowl. I have said all along, I've been saying this for years. I've been saying this since the inception of this show that I've been doing. That is not true. They do not have the best roster. I don't care if you're talking about on paper, obviously, or in person. They don't have the best defense. They don't even have a good defense. They're an average defense at best. They're not even really above average. They're just kind of a C average defense. And then when you look at the offense, I don't know what everybody thinks when they look at this offense that makes them say that Denver is only one elite quarterback away from being one of the most explosive offenses in the NFL. That's garbage. And I'll say this, and I said it a hundred times, and I've been saying it since the inception of this podcast. The Achilles heel for the Denver Broncos is John Elway. John Elway is the Achilles heel for the Denver Broncos. The first thing, if Denver is serious about winning, if they're serious about making a meaningful change, is to get rid of John Elway. He can't pick a staff. He can't pick a roster. And he sure as heck can't pick a quarterback. He may have been okay at quarterback. And again, I say okay because, again, John Elway had been in the league for how long? He won two consecutive Super Bowls when he got a running back that was unstoppable, when he got a defense that could stop everybody, but he could never put a team on his shoulders. So, again, he was an above-average quarterback. He requires, demands, and deserves a lot of respect as a former NFL quarterback, but you suck. As a general manager, John Elway, I'm sorry. There's no other way to say it. There's no way to be politically nice about that. John Elway is not a good general manager. Denver needs to cut ties with this guy. He is the reason why you guys are continuing to fail. He is the reason why you guys have bad coaching. He is the reason why you can't get a quarterback because he can't pick them. He cannot pick them. And he shouldn't be picking them. So it's a situation where I believe Denver because of Elway is a bad organization with again for whatever the reason with a soft spot in the NFL national analysts eyes that they want to continue to try and say how they've got this great defense this great offense all they're missing is a quarterback they're just a quarterback away no they're not no they're not You'll be able to see that tonight when Case Keenum, let me say the name one more time, Case Keenum. Why am I saying it twice? You have to say it twice because most people don't know who Case Keenum is. Unless you really followed college and unless you really followed the failure that is Case Keenum as a starting quarterback, nobody knows who Case Keenum is. And yet you're going to hear his name a lot tonight when he's running up and down the field with the Cleveland Browns as they put it to the Denver Broncos, because that's what's going to happen against that supposed alleged great defense of the Denver Broncos. So it's, again, one of those deals where tonight's game is two bad teams, kind of equally matched, but Cleveland is the better of the two. I honestly think this is an eight-point spread for Cleveland above Denver tonight. Uh, If I were betting in Vegas, And if there was a seven or a seven and a half point spread, uh, I I don't know what the spread is, but I'm saying if it was seven or seven and a half, I I would take Cleveland all day long. Absolutely. I would take Cleveland. Um, All right. Another thing that I wanted to talk about today is, oh, well, real quickly, before I get to this next thing. uh, So talking about Baker Mayfield and the fact that this is a contract year, there were a lot of things I wanted to mention in regards to that. Uh, Number one is this. I don't know because I don't know. I will never be like these national guys and claim that, you know, I'm inside somebody's head and I know what they're thinking. I know what they're feeling because I don't. And I will never be presumptuous like that. But what I will say is it's a contract year. We know traditionally when somebody's in a contract year, there's a lot of pressure. And why wouldn't there be, right? If it were me, if it were any of my friends, if it were anybody I knew and we were fighting for a contract, we're obviously going to fight to do as good as we can so that we can get 
as good of a contract that is available, right? And so you got to imagine, and again, hypothetically imagine Baker Mayfield is doing exactly that, trying to win his way into a large payday. Um, and there's a lot of people, because I was talking about this earlier before I went off on my little rabbit hole there. There's a lot of people that believe that the ownership and the general managers have made up their mind in regards to Baker Mayfield. Again, there are certain people that have said they decided they're going to move off of him. And there are other people that said they've decided that they'll offer him something. But again, it's going to be in the neighborhood of 150, not the 250 he's looking for. I would say this, though, because I'm not talking about money. What I'm talking about is Baker has a lot of pressure on him. And I don't know if the pressure is what's affecting him this year, because there is obviously a difference between years past and the way he's performing this year, right? Realistically, there's a huge difference. You can see it. He's regressing. He's going backwards. And he's not able to get one of the best premier receivers in Odell Beckham Jr. the ball. And like that right there in itself tells you there's a problem. Now, the question is, again, this is what I mean by there's so many tendrils to this. Is the problem that he can't communicate well with Odell Beckham? Is Odell Beckham that difficult of a player to play with? Uh, is it that he has better harmony with the other receivers and not OBJ? Uh, is it that OBJ has been injured and that playing through his injury has made it to where it's been hard for them to get in harmony? Because again, Odell Beckham has been doing a lot of rehab and trying to basically do what it takes to stay on the field. And he's had a hard time doing that this year. And so because of that, Baker's relying on the other receivers instead of Odell. That way, if Odell goes back down, that he won't have to suffer in his performance because Odell's not there for him. See, there's a lot of tendrils here. There's a lot of things that go hand in hand in regards to the performance of Baker Mayfield. Here's the thing. All those tendrils, even though you have all those question marks, the one thing, though, that nobody can deny is every quarterback and every great quarterback, let's word it that way, every great quarterback in the NFL has had those very issues, and yet they found a way to win and to get it done. Baker Mayfield has not. Again, I don't know whether it is because of the pressure of the contract year. I don't know. It could be. Some people crack under pressure. That's obvious. We've seen it a million times before. We all know some people crack under pressure. That's a fact. But I don't know because I'm not in Baker Mayfield's camp. I don't speak to him. I don't know him personally. And again, I'm just a sports fan. I'm not an inside guy with inside information. But the only thing that I will say, the one thing that I should say is that Baker Mayfield, in my opinion, needs to figure it out. Because if he does not, then you are definitely looking at a scenario where at the end of the season, he's either going to get the franchise tag or he's going to get told that they're not going to extend him. Either way, he's not exactly going to get what he wants. Although there are some who say that getting the franchise tag isn't necessarily a bad thing. But again, depends on how you look at it. Getting a franchise tag means they're putting a Band-Aid on a problem that they know exists, which means they're going to go search for their next quarterback. And that's obviously a position that Baker Mayfield doesn't want to be put in. So he needs to figure it out. Whatever the problem is, whether it's the pressure of the contract or whether he's got issues with his offensive coordinator or he doesn't have trust in Odell Beckham Jr. because he's been unhealthy and he hasn't been able to stay on the field consistently for him. So he's had to figure out how to work these other wide receivers on the roster. Whatever the issue is, it's not really going to be an excuse because every great quarterback has faced these very problems. Look at Aaron Rodgers. His receiving core has always been pretty much subpar. Let's be real, subpar. Look at Russell Wilson. His receiving core has always been subpar. Russell Wilson makes some no-name people look good. Aaron Rodgers makes some no-name people look good. But when they leave Russell Wilson, when they leave Aaron Rodgers, you never hear from those guys again. Why? Because they were only good playing with that caliber of a quarterback. So these excuses ain't going to work for Baker Mayfield. He's going to have to figure it out. But the bottom line is, I'll say what I've been saying for a while, and I know I'm going to be saying this even when the season ends, it's time for the Cleveland Brown fans to go back to putting the brown bags on their heads 
because the Browns are who they've always been. I know it doesn't make me popular in saying that, but I'm sorry. It's a fact. There's no fixing the problems the Browns have. There's no way in heck that they have a shot at making the playoffs because they can't win their division. And there's no way with the way that they're playing, even with Baker Mayfield, that they can make their way into the wild card. There's just no way. All right, now the final thing I want to talk about today is one of the craziest things I said uh, since all this stuff came out about uh, Deshaun Watson, that everybody needs to stop talking about him. He shouldn't be considered to be put on a roster. Nobody should be looking at making any moves with him, not because I'm saying he's guilty, not because I'm saying that there is something absolutely wrong, because I don't know, and I'm not claiming to know, and I'm not going to speculate. But what I will say is, if you're talking about a guy who's that caliber of a quarterback but has that kind of baggage surrounding him, then you got to be realistic. If you pick him up, you don't know what the end result of this legal matter is going to be. And not only that, but how good is he going to be? Where's his head at? How do you know that he's all in on playing football? What makes you think he's going to be able to focus on playing football? And what makes you think, and this to me is the ultimate thing, what makes you think having Deshaun Watson on your roster isn't going to be nothing but a distraction? You're going to have players that don't want him, even if they don't tell Deshaun to his face. Let's be realistic. You're going to have players that don't want him. You're going to have fans that aren't going to like the idea either. You're pretty much alienating a huge fan base called females, which is the number one fastest growing fan base in the NFL, which isn't really a good idea. There's probably going to be some sponsors that aren't going to want to sponsor you just because of the headache that Deshaun Watson brings to the team. Not to mention when the circus comes to town with the higher volume of media that's going to be following you and constantly and consistently asking you Deshaun Watson questions and you're trying to hide him from the media, you're going to be making it to where he minimally speaks. And when he does, He's going to have a promo person with him at all times, and they're going to try and be the ones to arbitrate and answer all the questions so Deshaun doesn't have to because most of, most of the questions aren't going to be football-related. While all that's going on, he's going to be nothing but a distraction. So as the Miami Dolphins, why would you make the stupid decision to potentially make a move to get Deshaun Watson to replace Tua? I get it. You're not in love with Tua. I'm not either. And I agree. You should move off of him. I absolutely agree. You should move off Tua. But to look desperate, to be desperate, to get Deshaun Watson, and then you don't know when that hammer is going to drop because of all the legalities, if it drops, if it drops. But I'll say this. It looks like something's going to happen. I think something is going to happen. It is safe to say something is going to happen. And I don't think the NFL should allow this. I don't think any team should be allowed to have Deshaun Watson. It sucks because you haven't been proven guilty. I get that. I understand that. But at any other Fortune 500 company, if somebody had 22 sexual assault allegations against them, I'm pretty sure. I even got a friend of mine who got fired from a job in Detroit for something similar to this. So if you think that in a Fortune 500 company that anybody who has 22, not just one, but 22 allegations against them, that they would allow that individual to come into the workplace and continue to work without the investigation and whatever is going to happen legally being completed, you're absolutely out of your mind. So if you can't do it in the regular nine to five world, what makes the NFL so special that they can get away with doing what nobody else can do? That doesn't make any sense to me. So that's why I say this is a bad idea. It's a bad look, right? The NFL has enough problems as it is, again, because you're still having to excuse Antonio Brown being in the league and a whole lot of others that you've let get away with a whole lot of garbage. And you've got a lot of media that's going to be all over this. And this is going to be a circus. And it's going to be a bad look for the NFL. It's not a smart play. I think that it would be, you know, really, really smart for the Dolphins to walk away from this conversation and not do the trade for Deshaun Watson. And the NFL shouldn't allow it to happen to begin with because, again, this is going to be bad press for the sport in general. Not just bad press for Miami, bad press for the sport. 
I already know of a couple of national networks that are already jumping on this and they've got a whole lot more waiting to go. You're going to see exposés and all kinds of stuff come out because they are ready to blow up all over the NFL on this deal. It's a bad idea. It's a bad look. Miami should walk away. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Time for me to go watch the uh, Dodger game. Again, I believe it's the last game of the season for the Dodgers. I believe Atlanta is going to pull off the upset, even though Vegas says the Dodgers will win tonight. I disagree. Uh, We'll find out if I'm right or wrong tomorrow. You guys have a great one.